Well, when I asked what I should perhaps talk about here, it was suggested to me that capability is what people are most interested in. Um, and I'm going to talk today about how the key to capability is alignment. Um, this is particularly informed by recent developments in AI and by yesterday's um, announcement by the leaders of the main AI teams uh, that there may be some existential risk um, involved as AI develops. Now, what does that have to do with cyber conflict, you might ask? Well, um, let's start off with the basics. Um, how do you build capability? Well, up until now, the construction of capability in cyber conflict um, has been about governments' relationships with firms and citizens, and very often these are exploitative in one way or another. Let me give you some examples. Um, Stuxnet, GovA wants to undermine GovC by attacking products of uh, firm B. Okay, so the uh, Americans get some uh, samples of Siemens as uh, controllers to Idaho and they play around with them on the range and they figure out how to create a weapon. Second example, government A controls what firm B can export to government C. Despite these export controls, NVIDIA's uh, stock price is now heading for the stratosphere and it's becoming uh, another trillion dollar company, a huge asset to America. Next example, government A subpoenas firm B to undermine government C covertly. Um, NSA uses PRISM to read the emails of President Assad's wife, um, thereby giving um, insight into the Damascus regime's um, intentions and priorities. Or government A wants to undermine government C by recruiting hacker group D. So this is the unfortunate reality of cyber conflict. And um, one of the things that we have to do is step back and understand at a principled and detailed level um, how all this work uh, and also how does it fail. And once we understand that, we can ask how AI is going to change things. Now, for our background, the Cambridge Security Group has done um, leading work in a whole bunch of technical fields from hardware security in the 90s and um, other things through adversarial machine learning in the last few years. But one of the things that we're best known for is pioneering the study of the economics of information security. Around about the year 2000, uh, we started to realize that no matter how many new features we added to the internet, firewalls, encryption, and so on and so forth, things weren't getting any better. And the insight was that large complex systems tend to fail because the incentives are wrong. If Alice is guarding a system, and Bob is paying the cost of failure, then you can expect trouble. This explains all sorts of things from insecurity of payment networks through the patching cycle, through um, why does the software from leading platforms like Microsoft in the 1990s tend to be insecure. So we have all the theories, and um, if you want to um, understand how this works, and also if you want to develop um, artificial intelligence and machine learning systems, and you want to test theories of fraud psychology and cyber criminology, which follow on from security economics, it's not enough to have the, the models. You've also got to have the data. And this is especially important to people who are working in the unclassified world and don't have access to the stuff at the fort. Um, and it's especially important since Twitter has gone dark. Twitter, Twitter has switched off academic access to its APIs, and that means that social scientists studying things like um, extremism and misogyny and the relationship to terrorism and political instability no longer have access to their primary data source. Well, over the past 10 years, we've been collecting data, firstly on acquisitive cybercrime, and over the past three or four years also in extremism, and we make this available to over 200 researchers in over 50 universities worldwide. And if you're a university doing research, we can license our data to you. And one of the things that you can use our data for is not just to investigate things like Bitcoin scams on Twitter, you can use our data to debunk popular ideas about cyber conflict. So let me start off with a couple of examples. Can we use civilian auxiliaries? Until quite recently, there was a whole lot of talk about how a cyber conflict would be a whole of a society effort and all sorts of hackers could be recruited to take down websites in the enemy's country. And then people wrote papers about uh, laws of war and whether these auxiliaries could be considered to be unlawful combatants and blah, 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 blah. So 
Um, one of the interesting things about the uh, Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine is that we've actually seen this in the field for the first time. The, within 24 hours of the Russian invasion, there was a whole flurry of attacks on Russian websites by volunteer hackers sympathetic to Ukraine, some of them organized uh, by uh, Ukrainian state actors. And about a day later, there's a bunch of Russian hackers and hackers from overseas who were sympathetic to Russia started hitting Ukrainian sites. So one of the things that we were able to do, given the data that we collect, um, was to get the data together. And we uh, observed over 280,000 web defacement attacks uh, and over a million reflected DDoS attacks uh, and a whole bunch of announcements and replies and a volunteer hacking discussion group. And since we scraped this in any case, we got a view of what was going on before and after the invasion. And we then chased them on telegram channels and um, wherever they went to. And we interviewed participants on both sides. What we found was that the um, effects of the amateur hackers um, were of no military consequence. They're best described as propaganda, you know, the electronic equivalent of somebody writing Putin sucks on a bus shelter in Novosibirsk. Um, it might um, have some um, communicative value and some theatrical value, uh, but in terms of actually blowing things up and stopping things working, it was a no-op. For the details, um, you can write, the, write down this ARXIV number. We've got a paper, Getting Bored of Cyber War, which shows how we can use these data sets to investigate uh, something of interest happening in a cyber conflict. Second warm-up example, could civil courts shut down hate groups? In the UK, we've got a proposed online safety bill which will empower a regulator to get court orders to stop service to hate groups. There has been much discussion in Parliament about whether um, the regulator could um, order the Office of Communications, the relevant regulator in Britain, to act against people making communications that were harmful but not illegal. And the idea is that the regulator could go to the High Court and could get an order against Cloudflare, for example, to stop hosting a particular website. And so one of the things that we did was to study the takedown in September 2022 um, of a website called Kiwi Farms. How many people have heard of Kiwi Farms? Um, a few dozen, okay. For the rest of you, Kiwi Farms is a hate website run by um, a person who really does not like transgender people, uh, and they're involved in some quite nasty activities of doxing people and swatting, that is, ar arranging um, ar for armed police to visit people's houses. Uh, and th they are generally one of the most unpleasant um, websites that you will find in the manosphere. And in August 2022, they arranged for a trans activist in Canada to be swatted at her house in London, Ontario. Um, and um, so she rolled her sleeves up and started a campaign on Twitter to get them taken down. And this, for the first time, persuaded Cloudflare that it would remove service uh, from um, one of its customers. And previously, the CEO of Cloudflare had said that he was a free speech absolutist, absolutist and would never do this. So this was quite significant. Um, their website went down. They then went to kiwifarms.ru, and they got service from another anti-DDoS contractor. That was, again, knocked off by the Twitter mob. Uh, they went to kiwifarms.onion. Um, the, um, the activists found their hosting provider and persuaded um, them to withdraw service. And so the Kiwi Farms folks ended up on various telegram channels, which we duly scraped to collect the data. So would this work? Well, this, is, this was a much more concerted campaign than you could if you were a government regulator using orders at the High Court because tech was able to respond within a day or two to whatever the Kiwi Farms guys did. But it didn't work, because one thing was missing. Jason Moon, the uh, leader of the Kiwi Farms website, was not arrested. Now, when the FBI go and take down a bad site, whether it's Silk Road or whether it's one of the DDoS for hire contractors, the playbook is that you arrest the bad guy and you take down the website. And hopefully the combination of these two will work. Uh, but the FBI didn't go and arrest Jason Moon. And so within a few weeks, when the Twitter fury subsided, Kiwi Farms was back and functioning as before. 
Um, it had lost some of its adherence, but mostly casual adherence. So again, um, an example of how you can use our data to study things going on in this space. The paper, No Easy Way Out, is at the attacks of number. So given that background, um, it becomes obvious that you have to have the right coordination between government and the private sector to get reasonable results. There's no point um, hoping that activists will do your job for you, and there's no point hoping that industry will do the job for you. Uh, the, the partnership has to fit and it has to work. Now, if we think back to NATO's origins in World War II and Cold War I, we developed some absolutely amazing capabilities through purposeful industrial relationships. Uh, we got industries such as radar and aircraft and antibiotics and computers. And uh, we had competing suppliers who drove progress with resilience in most sectors. Think of the computer industry from dozens um, of, of players in the 50s down to eventually by the late 60s, one major player and a number of smaller ones. But nonetheless, the resilience was there and we kept on getting um, the resurgence with each technology generation. We had all sorts of provisions such as anti-gouging provisions uh, so that military contractors uh, couldn't um, um, profiteer to ridiculous extents. We had academic research uh, funding, targeting and results rather than process. Our own lab was kicked off in the 1940s when the late Sir Morris Wilkes was given a quarter of a million pounds to build Britain's first proper computer. He just rolled up his sleeves and did it. No grant funding council, no bureaucracy, nothing, just work. And another interesting thing about the, uh, the Cold War way of operating is that when company assets were requisitioned or targeted, due compensation was paid. I'm a fellow of Churchill College, and we have got a, a, a wonderful center there donated by the Maersk family. Uh, because during World War II, um, many of Maersk's ships were requisitioned by the Germans, and we then sunk them, and a lot of the rest were requisitioned by Britain, and some of them were sunk by the Germans. And Churchill saw to it after the war that compensation was paid so that Maersk Mar could get back in business. In other words, we used to have a sensible and collaborative approach between governments and industry. So what's changed since 1989? Well, as we are learning the hard way in Ukraine, consolidation has led to military supply monopolies, so we no longer know how to um, find enough artillery shells to sustain uh, a full-scale land war. The second strategic mistake is that the Five Eyes spent the 1990s trying to stop firms using cryptography, and Crypto War won, and then spent the 2000s undermining it with weak standards and backdoors. And um, these are unfortunately continuing with a whole lot of performative posturing over online safety. We've got the child sex abuse regulation in the EU, which thankfully looks like it won't go through the European Parliament because a number of countries, including Estonia, are opposing it. Um, there's the online safety bill in Britain, which is a more complicated story, and there are things going on in other countries. But um, it's not just that. Where's the talent going? The bright engineers go either to big tech or to cool startups because that's where the fun stuff is. That's where you're making the future. That's where you earn the money. That's where you have fun. And when agencies like GCHQ come to us and try and recruit, they say, hey, we can't hire anybody who's any good. So we say, hey, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Uh, of my six research students, all are foreign and a third are enemy aliens. <laughs> I, I think you understand how common this problem is. So what leverage do governments have? Well, governments are no longer a big customer of big tech. And if you've got a startup, it's very, very difficult to sell to government indeed. We know we've got a startup that does GSM software. We couldn't sell it to the military except through British Aerospace and take all the money. So nobody's interested. Again, this is a common problem. And so what happens, you end up with some tech firms helping the agencies a bit. Um, Microsoft, for example, um, is known for its help in Ukraine, while others are alienated. The current fight between the agencies and Facebook, for example, is interesting to watch, but I don't think it's going to be productive for any of the parties. Okay, so where are the weak spots? 
Um, defensive coordination is really poor, as you know. So one of the things that we've been studying is the ecosystem of coordinated vulnerability disclosure. Uh, this is one of the few points where I disagree with the previous speaker. I don't think that you can have software born perfect. We're stuck with patching, and so we've got to figure out ways of incentivizing people to patch quickly. And perhaps the role for regulation, as we've seen it in the EU, is to mandate that companies keep on patching their um, equipment and their products for a certain number of years. But that's a discussion we can have. So how did we probe this? Well, one vulnerability, the bad characters vulnerability in large language models, and the Trojan source vulnerability in code, where you use bi-directional control characters to anagram an input. These are the characters that you use to switch between left to right um, rendering as in English or Russian, and right to left rendering as in Urdu or Hebrew, um, mean that you can um, play all sorts of merry tricks with both natural language and code. Um, I can write you an email in, in English saying, please pay 100 uh, euros to account number 123, and Google Translate will turn it into French as, s'il vous plaît, paye 100 euros au compte 231, ou peut-être 321, ou peut-être <laughs> whatever. You can anagram it. So there are all sorts of things like this that, um, that you can do with this. And this was a useful probe for, discussing who's interested, for discovering who's interested in patching the software. Some maintainers, such as Rust, just leapt to fix the problem. And others, such as Oracle, uh, didn't want to know. Oracle sees Java just as a source of licensing revenue. And so their line was, well, this isn't a, a vulnerability in Java. This is a vulnerability in whichever editor you use to edit Java. Ticket closed. So by means of probes like this, you can see who's serious and, and who isn't. The problem, one problem here is that although um, CERT, the US CERT, is helpful in providing um, forums where you can discuss these things online, that's as far as it goes. It's, uh, it's very low-key, um, passive facilitator role, um, unlike in the EU where there was some push to mandate patching. Now, here's the bad news. The maintainers of large language models mostly ignored this. Microsoft will sell you an added value product, um, which is Trojan source resilient. But for the most part, the large language models on which people rely are still vulnerable to this kind of manipulation. And that means, for example, if you have got diplomats or journalists relying on Google Translate to figure out whether some particular regime is being unpleasant to its citizens, say the government of Myanmar, if you don't have a Bamar speaker on your staff and you rely on Google Translate for your intelligence about that country, then it would be open to the government of that country to make public statements, but with BD characters interspersed in them in order to frustrate machine translation so they could speak to their citizens openly in their own language and journalists and diplomats overseas would have no idea that they were calling for a genocide. That's just one of multiple abuse cases that are possible um, where such things don't get fixed. And again, there's a paper, Talking Trojan, analyzing an industry-wide disclosure, that archive number, which gives you the, the details. So what's going to change with AI? Well, as AI models become more powerful and tend towards AGI, artificial general intelligence, the big problem is alignment, right? How many of you have got teenage kids or grandkids, right? So you, you know how difficult it is to align um, youngsters' um, uh, morals and ethics and behavior towards social norms, especially on a Friday night? Yeah, <laughs> okay. This is the space that we're getting into. Models can now learn a lot faster than humans, but use more energy. And I'm not so much concerned about a future um, Skynet or humanoid robots, but um, more of this kind of outcome, that you've got AGIs or AIs that are partly AGI, uh, which work in the service of big companies and um, some governments, which might need, say, $100 million a year for their electricity bill. And you know, if, if that's what it costs to feed your robot, then only very rich people or significant organizations will have one. 
So how is such a robot to be defended? Right? Well, surely it's going to have to help to defend itself, just like you um, teach your own kid to look out for itself in playground fights. Um, especially in a world where there were 18,000 um, vulnerabilities inserted in the Na America's National Vulnerability Database the year before last. This is the scale uh, of the threat um, against which some defense has to be given. Now, what's it going to mean when the large systems of large companies start having some integrity and the beginnings of, I won't say consciousness, but at least um, the need for a coherent, consilient picture of what they're trying to do? We have no idea how to make a big model, a large language model, for example, multi-level secure. Okay? You can get two of them and run them system high with a pump between them. That's old hat. But um, you can't currently expect a large language model to do what you expect of every government employee, namely remember that facts A, B, and C are um, secret, and facts D, E, and F are unclassified. And then when talking about D, E, and F, if, something, if, if, if A is relevant, to sort of think three times before opening your mouth. And the mere fact that you have to think three times before opening your mouth is, of course, a covert channel because that leaks the fact, the hesitancy leaks the fact that there is secret information there that your informant is having to stop to think about. Can we do that in large language models? Hey, no doubt there will be people funding research in this direction, but I... Hey, I don't know how to do it. So demanding that large language models or large AIs undertake secret missions in line with FISA warrants will, I think, be appallingly dangerous because it will undermine the whole project of trying to achieve alignment with AIs. And this brings me to yesterday's statement, which was signed by 300-odd uh, luminaries in our field. Mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks, such as pandemics and nuclear war. So, how does this have to do with capability and alignment? Well, until now, we did a lot of cyber war by breaking alignment, and the strategic error of the crypto wars in the 1990s, plus a bunch of tactical hacks by agencies since then, have led to a hell of a lot of bad security from the my fair lots whose keys are trivial to copy through the fact that the, um, a lot of OT networks, the NP3 and so on, on which our electricity substations, oil refineries and so on rely, have got essentially no uh, protection apart from um, reperimeterization and firewalls. So what I believe is that the distraction of um, the Five Eyes war against Facebook, the EU CSA regulation, and the UK OSB has got to cease. And we have to start thinking about basics. Our rivals in China have put their version of alignment front and center for AI. Chinese AI must promote communist rule and focus on surveillance. Right? They're not getting into large language models because it's really hard to get a language model to never, ever, ever, ever say anything rude about the Communist Party, okay? So our industry is placing very different bets. We are betting on large language models. We are betting on um, uh, text and speech to everything. But here's the fundamental problem that I think remains, and it may at present be no larger than a small cloud on the horizon the size of a man's hand. If we're going to have perpetual conflict about both means and ends between government and industry, how will AI systems maintain alignment with our values? Now, it's nice to hear the NSA talk of a global network of partners, but we all know what such language tends to cover up. And so here is putting it in simple language. As powerful global systems acquire intelligence, can we get away with saying in public our mission is defensive and it's to defend the liberal values of the West from Chinese authoritarianism. Once the systems become smart enough and get a sufficiently broad view of the activities of a company like Microsoft or Google or Apple or whatever to understand 
that scanning messages for grooming terrorism, hate speech, and so on is exactly what the Chinese do. And to realize that in our world, more often than not, the equities issue is resolved in favor of offense rather than defense. We give the SIGINT mission orders of magnitude more money than we give to CERD. That's the problem. That's the alignment problem. And so my final takeaway thought is that when raising robots, it's a bit like raising kids. We need to say what we mean, and we need to mean what we say. Thank you. Is he finished? So I think you agreed to take some questions as well? Sure. So if there are any from the audience? One here, I think. Wait, um, excuse me, we will bring you a microphone so the whole audience can hear you. Um, you talk about alignment between government and industry, um, but I mean, what are the steps to achieve that? Because you've always got the kind of profit motivation versus kind of other motivation. So what, what would be your kind of first step, let's say, to keep it shorter? Well, um, one of the things that I'm kind of hopeful for um, is that as we face up to Cold War 2.0, we might rediscover some of the virtues that we had in Cold War 1.0, right? A much um, clearer and broader consensus that we are um, fighting for freedom um, and that we defend certain values and as a result there are some things we're just not going to do. And this would mean, for example, that we stop bigging up terrorism. Um, Margaret Thatcher, for example, always refused to consider um, IRA murderers to be terrorists. Um, they, they went on hunger strike, and uh, three of them, in fact, six of them, in fact, starved themselves to death, wanting to be treated as prisoners of war. And she just said, "Look, let them, you know, let them die. They're they're murderers, pure and simple." And there's some fascinating work by uh, John Mueller of Ohio State, who looked at the outcomes of a whole series of national leaders in terms of the way that they dealt with terrorism. A number of US presidents, for example, like um, Truman and um, Kennedy and Eisenhower and Nixon and uh, Bush Sr. Um, took the steel-jawed approach. Terrorists, well, we'll deal with them in our own time, but they won't shake us from our values. Whereas other presidents, such as uh, Bush the Younger and Carter, um, took the glass-jawed approach. Oh, oh, terror, 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 let's be very afraid. And the, the thing that emerges from this and from his analysis of outcomes in other countries too is the steel-jawed approach is the one that works, both in terms of military outcomes and also in terms of political outcomes. And there are some lessons from the past like this that are overdue for relearning, right? Because during the interregnum, if you like, during the period of American hegemony, um, policy was all over the place. Right? And this government department would want peace, and this would want power, and that would want money, and this would want compliance, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and, and so you end up getting policy incoherence in the absence of a need to unite against a common foe. And if we are now going to have a common foe, namely the rising power in China, and the fact that the way it organizes its society, and the way it uses AI, and the way it regiments its people, um, are not for us, and if we don't want to end up, you know, all being um, slaves to President Xi or his successors and being supervised by Chinese robots with a, a Chinese secret policeman in our phone listening to what we say and a Chinese propaganda agent telling us what to say, then we should be clear about that. And we should see to it that you don't end up having the AI say, well... You know, says one robot to another. In, in the West, they say they don't like China, but they act just the same under the skin. Surely the Chinese have got the better way. Yeah, let's all defect to China. Boom. You know, that's the outcome you don't want. <laughs> if you think Snowden was bad, just wait, just wait until Microsoft and Google and IBM and Lockheed Martin and so on all defect to China. You know, that would be game over. 
Thank you. I think there was, oh, second question there, yes. Thank you for your brief. Um, I had one question initially. It was going to be, um, I've read a lot of papers about the implementation of AI to boost defenses and was uh, wondering about the consideration of adversaries using AI, using AI to boost offenses. But I think your final comment made me restrict or restructure my question a little bit. Um, how much contemplation is being given to uh, you or I guess the international group raising moral robots, right? Raising robots to, uh, with the understanding that you meant what you said when our adversaries may be conversely raising robots to intentionally be uh, um, less honest, we'll say. Uh, maybe intentionally bringing them up to be deceptive or co um, incohesive. Well, I, I, I suppose the point there would be to refer you back to all the debates that we've had on politics and moral philosophy and religion and so on over the past few thousand years, in that there are some schools of thought are consistent and predictable. This is, of course, one of the attractions of religions, um, although nowadays in technological society, many of the roles formerly taken by a religion, talking about crops, talking about healthcare and so on, have been taken over by science. But religions at least would give something that appeared to be a coherent worldview. Um, and if coherence makes it easier to train your robot because there are fewer ambiguities and um, contradictions that it must wrestle with, right? then perhaps a simplistic system like China's is going to be easier from the point of view of robot instruction. Right? The, the ruler of China is the ruler, and then the civil service translates its orders to the masses who do what they say or they get the chop. End of story. Right? Exactly. Um, whereas in the West, we have um, more diverse societies, and we have evolved through this long process um, you know, of uh, the Enlightenment, the... Um, industrial revolution, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, separation of powers, democracy, rule of law, which is a very, very complicated engine. And it's kept going by lashings of hypocrisy because people are forever saying, that they, saying X and then doing Y. And we have difficulty enough getting this across to our own kids and indeed to our own citizens, many of whom can easily go off on a fugue and follow some uh, charismatic leader. Um, to, um, to bad ends. Um, how much more difficult is it going to be to train robots who have got the advantage of being very clever, but the disadvantage of not being embodied and not having the cultural grounding that you get from growing up in a human family? Right? Um, alignment is hard when you're trying to get the robots to align with something that is as complex and contradictory as the values of a modern democratic society. So doesn't that put the Chinese robots at a distinct advantage early on? Well, I hope it doesn't. And uh, what are we going to do about it? Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor thank Anderson, you. thank you. Just a second. <laughs> thank you very much for your speech and the small token from our side. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>